So it started now. Hello, everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever, whichever time zone you are. Um, I'm Suzanne uh, from the current IMOS board, and I am actually located in year in the Netherlands right now. So um, not a bad time for me tonight. Uh, and I want to welcome all our guests and speakers of today. Uh, we have four lightning talks, four speakers for lightning talks. Uh, in the meantime, while listening, uh, you can send your questions or comments in the chat and we will look at them at the end of the talks. Um, we would, I would like to start with our first speaker, who is Valentin Dankchev, uh, who is a lecturer in computational social science in the Department of Sociology at the University of Essex. And the title of his talk is The Network Marketplace for Responsible Sharing of Research Data. You can share your screen now. Thank you. Okay, hopefully you can see my screen. Yes, all good. Wonderful. Okay, let me get started. Yes, I'm, um, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Valentin Danchev, and yes, I'm a lecturer in computational social science at the University of Essex. And today I would like to talk about network marketplaces and responsible data sharing. So it's a conceptual talk outlining opportunities and challenges for implementing network marketplaces for harnessing responsible sharing of research data at scale. My use case will be individual level participants data or IPD from clinical trials, but some or many of the propositions can be applied to data sharing in general. Sharing of individual participant data has benefits, but also potential risks. The benefits include transparency, reproducibility, minimizing redundancies and accelerating discovery. Prior work has also identified a range of potential risks, preventing researchers from sharing IPD. These risks include protection of patient privacy and confidentiality, fear of being scooped on secondary publications, the time-consuming nature of data management and sharing, and fear of inappropriate reuse and replication. Uh, due to those potential risks and obstacles, sharing of IPD has, relatively, has been relatively low. For example, this is data from clinicaltrials.gov about registered COVID-19 trials as of May 2020. And as you can see, it's just about above 10% of, uh, uh, of the registered trials that want to share IPD and data, and most of them actually. Uh, do not. Um, so there are different approaches have been proposed to incentivize and accelerate responsible data sharing. One such approach are data sharing policies. Uh, the International Committee of Medical Journal uh, Editors implemented a data sharing policy which does not mandate data sharing but requires a data sharing uh, statement from submissions reporting clinical trials effective July 2018. And with colleagues from Stanford University Medical School, we evaluated the data sharing statement requirement. And what we found is that uh, indeed 69% of the uh, journal articles uh, proposed that they declare that they will share the data. So as a behavioral norm, it seems that data sharing is uh, relatively well accepted, but then only two IPD sets were actually de-identified and publicly available out of 487, and another 17 were found in uh, data repositories. So we found that a wide gap between declared and actual data sharing uh, exists. And another approach to incentivizing data sharing aims to link data sharing to scientific credit and promotions, and in this way generate indirect incentives for data sharing. And so this is an uh, approach of indirect incentives uh, using authorship and promotion are very valuable in the long term but there is a considerable time lag between the sharing of a data set and the accumulation of potential credit. And this is a kind of a drawback. 
So a third approach to incentivizing data sharing is what I would call network data marketplaces. And so what are network data marketplaces? Uh, these are just socio-technical infrastructures that connect dispersed data contributors with data reusers in a network and facilitate data exchanges. And typically an, an analogy and uh, would work here. And um, so we can think of a marketplaces such as Airbnb and others in the pre Airbnb lodging marketplaces, many would host relatives and friends, but never strangers, right? And so the, it's very much like the current data sharing uh, space where many investigators will share their data with co-investigators and collaborators, but not with scientists at large. And so the Airbnb has transformed the, the lodging marketplace, making it possible for numerous unknown hosts and travelers to securely connect. And so the idea is, can we use some of those insights from our online marketplaces to help accelerate IT sharing? So what kind of problems such network data marketplaces need to solve? Um, so one of the problems is that what I mentioned about these direct benefits that can sharing usually they get this indirect but with uh, those are equipped with a time lag. the second is that exchanges of clinical trial data lacks quality essential for well-working marketplaces and this is thickness and because insufficient number of investigators are incentivized to participate in the ITD exchanges so it's a very thin market and even if shared data will be scattered across different repositories, lacking mechanisms for integrated and federated uh, data access and, and reuse. So what are the principles that I think will be very uh, helpful for a network data marketplace? The first one is that data contributors get prompt access to data others have shared. So data contribution is associated with data access. The second is, community-based repositories in which researchers working on a particular problem work, uh, they store data in the same repositories. And this could actually cause some fragmentation. And so the third principle is that this research access, uh, researchers will access data from different repositories in a single data analytics platforms to accelerate reuse. So it's kind of an integration uh, on those um, various community-based repositories. And principles one and two aim to incentivize data sharing and maximize network effects because more contributors will, will join and that will increase actually maximize the network effects and that will also make data withholding less optimal. And the principle three aims to integrate and uh, facilitate reuse. So there are many challenges, of course. The online marketplaces that we know are typically monetary and the network data marketplace is not. Also navigating across different heterogeneous restrictions from repository sponsors and funders is a, is a big challenge. And another challenge is that in the data reuse and data sharing, there is another um, actor, which are the participants. We know from studies that um, uh, participants of, of clinical trials are, are, are supporting data reuse, but it needs to be put in place safe, safeguarded mechanisms for privacy protection so that to ensure trustworthy and responsible data reuse. There are already different initiatives that implement or are aligned with these principles of network data marketplaces, for example, the European Open Science Cloud and also the HDR UK. Uh, promote uh, trusted research environments. Um, the Bibli platform also is an uh, active actor in this space. These are my acknowledgements from the uh, Metrics Research Center and the International Forum and also the Stanford University uh, School of Medicine. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Valentin. That was just a little, a few minutes over five. So that was great. Thank you for keeping up your promise. <laughs> Thank you. Um, if you have any questions for Valentin, please uh, send it to the chat. We will uh, read them at the end. Um, so you can stop sharing now.
Yep. And then our next speaker is Adam Vialsmore, who is a product specialist uh, at Persistence Identifier at JISC, sorry, in the UK, and also has a secondary role at the UK ORCID community support. And his talk is PR Voices Updates from the Practice Research Intersectional Project. Yes, and his uh, slide is up. There we go. So uh, I, I think I have to actually say, can you see my slides, even though I think I can see them anyway? Um, feel free to nod or, you know, whatever. Fabulous. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. Oh, thumbs up. Thank you so much. Adrian. So, um, okay. So this is a lightning talk about a team that have put together a project and that project um, we're on a YouTube channel recording is something that we very much hope will exist very shortly. And I will make no further comment on that. Um, this is the bit where I now get grumpy at things. So um, what do all of these things have in common? Well, apart from the fact they were all really um, good and most of them were in the before times and they had some really nice wine. Um, they were um, things where we had discussions about practice research. Practice research, you say? Yes, indeed, practice research. Um, practice research uh, tends to encompass a kind of dynamic collection of outputs and it's something that you would perhaps not necessarily have heard about or thought about as much as some of the other things that are considered um, in the academy. So although it includes text, um, it also is considered for the non-textual outputs, the artifacts, compositions, designs, digital, visual media, exhibitions, performances. Um, and we've got a big list here, and again, this is a lightning talk, but basically um, it's not really well served by the kind of repository capture, let's have a space where um, this research is actually available for access, discovery, reflection, and interpretation. And so there's a bit at the bottom that says, this team wants to change it, and that's exactly the case. So PR Voices um, kind of started in Pitapalooza, which again, you know, it was online, but it was still a blast. Um, and it's based on work uh, from the University of Westminster with Haplo, also called Chaos, um, and JISC, uh, which is where I work. We've been looking at ways to capture practice research more effectively. There's a link there, it should really be a DOI, but there you go, um, on uh, that particular um, talk. And who are the partners in this? Well, there's the University of Westminster, um, and that is. Um, an entry that you could follow the DIT, but it's kind of blurred, you know, just to give it a, a, a moment of it's there, but we don't really want people to focus or concentrate on that. And, uh, you know, it should have a bit of privacy. So, so um, Westminster has been working with Haplo to build uh, a repository to capture all research. Um, they've been working closely with arts, architecture, practice research community. Um, it's based on the open source Haplo repository. So, you know, it's something that's out there and available. We've got three updated templates. Um, we've got a number of issues with existing standards. We'll come on to that in a minute. And um, we've been working with um, JISC to address these. And there's something called the Prague UK survey. Come on to that in a minute. Um, we've got the British Library as a partner. They've also got a shared repository service that supports the GLAM sector. Um, and they lead the data site consortium in the UK and their practice-based research, evidence-based practice feed into their business as usual and doing all of those things. JISC, where I work, um, we've been working on practice and non-text as part of the wider scholarly landscape. Um, so I am, for my sins, uh, previously an actual proper researcher. My dad's a biochemist, he gets very funny about the whole kind of like, you know, not doing real things anymore. Um, so we've, uh, been looking at kind of practice, non-text. I am, you know, also a published poet, so I do get quite funny about this whole kind of, let's write an article. Well, let's, you know, actually think about other ways of expressing this stuff. Um, we have very recently um, worked on persistent identifiers um, and the benefits of actually ensuring that the information in the scholarly space um, is correct and complete 
And when you underpin that, you get these wonderful efficiencies that save time, that saves money, and actually makes research better. It, not just because you know, you're saving the money and stuff, but because you've actually got all of this richness available to you. Um, and we have a just commission to support the critical infrastructure and pinning research. Um, right, these reports. So um, the Practice Research Advisory Group in the UK produced two reports by Bully and San. Um, there's a DOI for it. And the first report was, what is practice research? If you want to find out about that, read report one. Report two was a very pragmatic kind of what do we need? What do we need to do? So that was um, structuring practice research, um, item types for it, formats, metadata, peer review, storing and preserving those outputs and sharing them. And they had um, a set of conclusions about um, the importance of exploring formats, discussing, discussing the adoption of a collective project research output item type. Now, I also in just in my PID work, um, work on something called RAID, the Research um, Activity Identifier. It's a project um, persistent identifier. Kind of already answered that question for them, so that's fine. Uh, to involve research support professionals. Yep, that's uh, something that, say, um, PR Voices and an intersectional community would do to explore the need for visibility, new peer review model, yep. Investigate the founding of an open library of practice research, the OLPR, that harvests and hosts peer reviews, um, provides specific support and embodies the principle of open access. Sounds good, doesn't it? Um, so, uh, the PR Voices project would, if it ever came into being, um, identify the technical requirements for repository platforms that are fair, um, inform future discussions, um, across the metadata community uh, to actually, you know, influence these changes that are necessary. It would be a baseline to inform discussions um, for future work, but kind of most importantly, it would use all those three things to build the PR community of practice, so the practice community of practice to inform the future development. So and a lot of issues at the moment are around kind of the kind of fragmentation of practice research across because it's kind of underpins everything there's a bit of practice you know um across most disciplines right some the way you do stuff's important and capturing that stuff is important so embodying and embedding that and capturing that and reflecting that is also important um so practice research captured and preserved is discoverable reusable enabling its impact to be measured so the HRC Future Data Services call, which closed several months ago and is due to give its results on um, the end of September so that we can start in the second week of October. Saying no more in the live recording. Um, will soon let us know if we can start that work. So thank you very much for your attention. On Twitter and Instagram, find us at PR Voices. That's myself. Um, Jenny and Rachel who could make it today and uh, uh, you know soon soon we will say more thank you excellent thank you Adam <laughs> you get some applauses <laughs> oh, thank you. oh sorry just before I forget um, we have slightly taken over Amos so we had a um, discussion yesterday thanks for that uh, Jenny's put the padlet she is here um, in there if you want to have a look or contribute. There's a hackathon this evening, tomorrow morning, the end of the day, time zone, whatever. Um, and there's also a workshop near the end of the conference. Details are available in your Shiny app or program. Thank you. Perfect. Great advertisement. <laughs> <laughs> Please visit uh, Adam's hackathon and workshops. <laughs> Sounds really interesting. Um, next up, we have Rose Frenzen from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And her talk is, you don't need a PhD to practice good science. The case for studying behaviors of research st stuff. Yeah, research stuff. <laughs> All right, let me get my slides set up. Okay. Can everyone see that? Oh, it's loading. 
Okay. Double click to enter um, full screen mode, it says. What? Um, let me see. Oh, it might. Just a moment. Resume. Yes, share. it works now. If that works. Okay. And you can see the slides. One second. Um, yes, now, yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Cool. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, okay. So uh, I will just jump straight into it. Um, so, as we all know, there's a wide variety of factors that play into issues with replicability in the scientific literature. Um, and so far, the meta science field seems to have kind of a particular focus. So, uh, there's been a lot of in investigation into questionable research practices like p hacking, harking, selective reporting. Um, and from that, there's also been an emphasis on developing. Uh, interventions to decrease some of these practices, so pre-registering, code sharing, etc. Um, additionally, there's also been some scholarship surrounding uh, the institutional pressures and incentives that drive some of these behaviors, and then subsequently policy level initiatives intended to ameliorate some of those problems. Now, while all of this is great and really, really important work, it's centered the conversation primarily around uh, primary investigators and those with a high level of intellectual ownership of their scholarship, particularly those with PhDs and PhD candidates. Uh, for the purposes of the talk, I'll refer to that sort of group broadly as researchers. Um, and while it makes sense for things like, um, you know, sharing data to focus on people who have the authority to share the data, um, I think it's defined our scope of what we're considering a little bit too narrowly. Um, so if you take a, a step back for a moment, it's clear that researchers, as defined, only make up a small fraction of the labor involved in the production of scientific research. Uh, in fact, in many labs, uh, particularly large ones, research staff such as lab technicians, research assistants, and research coordinators actually outnumber researchers. So by leaving research staff out of the focus, there's a number of pieces of the research process that we're not studying in particular detail. Uh, the mechanics and execution of many tasks um, often conducted by research staff uh, include things like the actual collection of the data. Um, so whether that's preparing to do so, preparing the experiments, things like that, um, doing the lab work, um, administering surveys and interviews to participants, actually physically gathering the data. Um, additionally, data extraction often falls on uh, a lot of these research staff roles. So going through and coding behaviors and responses, scoring measurements, uh, entering data that needs to be manually entered, uh, pre-processing, so cleaning data, integrating data from multiple sources, performing quality assurance checks, um, and finally, uh, data management throughout the project lifecycle. So documenting, metadata creation, all of the above. Now, while many of these tasks may seem fairly straightforward on the surface, um, especially if you're given guidance, uh, speaking with individuals who do this kind of day-to-day -day work reveals a lot of nuance in what they do. While in some labs, there might be meticulously documented workflows for each and every step and possible variation, um, in other labs, there's a fair amount of gray area and individual freedom. Um, this can also be further exacerbated by the fact that a lot of research staff roles are temporary by design. Uh, they are, are supposed to be stepping stones for individuals who have maybe finished an undergraduate degree and want to go back to school and get a PhD um, later on. And so as a result for long-term projects, this can mean that these pretty important responsibilities change hands repeatedly over the course of uh, the project's lifespan. So when discussing this with researchers, I've occasionally received some skeptical responses about the importance of these factors on the eventual replicability of research. Uh, so how much does it matter? What's the likelihood of these steps actually having broader implications? Well, honestly, we can't know for sure if we don't study it. Um, that being said, because these are steps at which data is pretty vulnerable to corruption or loss of integrity just because of the, the sort of fluid and changing nature of it, um, I think that these tasks are likely to be at least as important as some of the other areas we focused on. Um, additionally, these are areas where issues in the process can be particularly insidious. So um, 
if, for instance, something happens during the creation or curation process of the data that impacts it, um, unless it's like pretty egregious, that's something that's going to become baked into the data and it might not be easy or even possible to suss it out after the fact. Um, all we know that open practices like data sharing could actually be causing harm to the overall um, accuracy of the field if the data being shared are problematic or if by engaging in those behaviors it's giving a false signal of quality or validity when these core practices um, involving the actual curation of the data are not in place. And to be clear, I don't want to suggest that research staff are a primary source of faulty conclusions or that they need to be you know, increasingly scrutinized or micromanaged um, because of like incompetence or poor work. Uh, in fact, research staff are also capable of having an incredibly positive impact on the quality of the data. Uh, as individuals who work the most closely with data at its most granular level, they can provide an incredibly important fail-safe mechanism for protecting the integrity of the study. So how frequently do things fall on either end of the spectrum? Well, we have no way of knowing until we study it. Um, so inclusion, in, in order to get a fuller picture of the factors impacting replicability, we need to begin empirically studying the work of research staff just as closely as we have begun studying the work of researchers. Once we have a better understanding of the activities conducted at the level of research staff, only then can we begin to develop interventions and educational resources to, improve, to further improve the replicability of research at that level. Thank you so much. Feel free to reach out to contact me um, on email or on Twitter. Right. Thank you so much, Rose. That was really interesting and really insightful. Oh, we are having a little bit delay with your sound, I think. Oh, okay. thank you. <laughs> uh, okay. On my end, she had a little bit of uh, technical voice issues, but anyways, it's solved now. Our last speaker is Adrian Miller. Adrian did her PhD in neuroscience and is now the Associate Director of Scientific Education and Outreach at Stanford University's Cardiovascular Institute. And her talk is, what professors have against reproductibility? Yes. Thank you. Uh, everyone can see my screen. All good. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, cool. So I'm excited to tell you guys about this um, topic. Uh, I uh, chose a kind of inflammatory topic here to get you guys uh, to be excited about this, but I think what I'm talking about is something that we're probably all pretty familiar with, is, which is about a, a culture change that we're probably all working towards, which is to have us all develop more um, uh, open reproducible research practices. So. Uh, I'm going to tell you guys about three scenarios, uh, and I'm going to use these two actors to tell you about these three scenarios. Um, the Border Collie will represent me or someone that I work with uh, in education and outreach at Stanford. Uh, and I run a bunch of training programs, which is how I am involved with training in reproducible research methods. And then I'm also going to use this stag to represent any number of uh, faculty members at Stanford across different departments. Uh, and I'm just going to launch into these three scenarios. And the first one uh, was when we asked uh, our faculty how we should address the NIH's new mandate to provide enhanced training and methods of reproducible research. The NIH, for those who are not from the US, is a big funding agency for health research in the United States. It's one of the biggest ways you, uh, people get grants to do research in the United States. Um, so I asked for some faculty this question, and they said, oh, what are you talking about? This is just busy work. This is a tick box. Why would we do this? And the other response I got was, you know, we're already doing a great job. I don't think this is necessary. <laughs> and so my reaction was one of surprise, of course. Um, but then um, I had to continue the dialogue and I realized what they're actually saying was, um, I don't understand why this is necessary. Um, it seems impractical. Um, we weren't doing it before. Why do you need to do it now? And what uh, the second thing they were saying when they said that um, everyone's doing a great job already is that they really do, um, from what they see uh, in their labs and among their colleagues, believe that everyone is already doing super strong, rigorous research. And once I, you know, understood that's what they were trying to communicate, I felt a lot better. Uh, scene two uh, was when um, we pursued some training in reproducible methods, uh, and then we um, were trying to figure out how we should structure that, and we said, hey, what if we perform replication studies using data from our own labs? Because we have a bunch of labs at Stanford, they can make great data, why don't we look at it? Uh, the reaction to that was, you're kidding. No, that's way too risky. Uh, they, they might find mistakes. Um, or, and also, hey, uh, it's way too hard. Um, we shouldn't even try to do this because we'll have to spend a lot of work making that happen. 
And my reaction for that was also, as you'd expect, quite quite disappointed. Um, but then once again, um, I continued to investigate this further and figure out what was going on. I realized what they were actually saying was, um, what if these untrained undergraduates make a mistake and then they publish that and then my grad student who I care about uh, very deeply uh, has suddenly has their career ruined because of uh, um, a mis uh, calculation during this replication that these untrained folks are, 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 are trying to get out. Um, how would if it tarnishes the reputation of my trainees? And when they said it's way too hard, what they actually meant was um, 10 weeks for, which is the program that I work on, um, to replicate four years of PhD labor from perhaps multiple postdocs or graduate students is unfeasible <laughs> as a project. Um, there's no way that you, you guys can get it done. And so um, uh, once I understood it in those terms, I realized again uh, that, um, hey, um, maybe they have some really good points here and it's not as bad as I thought. Uh, their, their motives are good. Um, and I think you guys are starting to recognize the pattern here, but um, we then uh, proceeded to do, we pivoted from trying to do a replication study using their data to doing a meta research study using um, already existing information in the field and published works. And we then uh, said, hey, we found a problem with this very specific research practice. It's incredible. How about we publish that? What do you guys think, faculty members at Stanford? Uh, and they said, I don't know. I think we might lose credibility. And we here is not um, Stanford, but we is the field um, that this is talking about. That's where this um, specific practice was being a problem. And the other response was, I don't know. I think you'll make too many enemies. And once again, I was sad. We were sad. We're like, oh, maybe we, can, maybe we can't do this. But then again, we uh, investigated further and we realized what they're trying to say was, you know, my colleagues are really doing great work. And yeah, maybe there's some problem specific practices, but I don't want to diminish all of this awesome stuff that they're doing by pointing out these small mistakes. And hey, I don't want to hurt my trainees' careers by antagonizing established players in the field. If we um, start casting aspersions, then maybe they'll have a harder time getting a job. And I care about my trainees and I want them to succeed, which are very nice motivations. And so I felt better again. And so um, what I wanted to convey here is that um, what I found in my work in uh, uh, training uh, undergraduates and graduates and postdocs at Stanford is that professors um, think have these three main reasons for um, not wanting to engage in more heavily reproducible research um, training. Uh, and that is because they think it's not necessary, that it's not practical, and that it's not nice. Um, and that these are not necessarily bad motivations because what they're really saying is that, uh, because they're, they're, these, are, these uh, statements are stemming from them being idolis, idolistic, excuse me, from being very efficient because the researchers uh, and also being very compassionate both towards their trainees and towards their um, fellow colleagues. And um, I, as you saw from my three scenarios, I had to learn again and again and again that my initial reaction of um, disappointment and surprise and sadness was not, not um, as accurate to a good reflection of what was actually happening. And that faculty concerns are often you know, pretty darn reasonable and that um, I was able to make progress with all these projects once I was able to understand where they were coming from. And I hope that um, everyone else is able to have similar success with your own faculty, with your own institutions. Now I'll stop sharing. Thank you so much, Adrian. And I would like to thank all our speakers for these great talks. And I want to start the discussion now. If you have any questions, I'll, I'll see. Now I had I seen some comments for um, for Rose. First of all, I don't know if you wrote, if you want to comment on that, Rose. Um, yeah, sure. So the, the one in particular was, uh, Adam, you know, asked about, uh, uh -huh. the, the hidden ref in a hidden project, ref. which I hadn't heard about. I, I briefly just looked at it. Um, and it looks really, really cool and really exciting. Um, you know, I hope it says that their goal is to kind of translate it into broader consideration and, and like, I guess, emphasizing that these roles are also important, um, which I think uh, a, I hope it, it does sort of translate into that. And I think it also gets at one of the points that I didn't get into, which sometimes I guess maybe the more pessimistic side of me wonders if the reason that we don't spend as much time and effort studying these is because these um, aren't considered a, either A, as glamorous or B, as like important contributions or as valuable contributions um, to the field. And so we focus more on like the intellectual creation parts and less on like you know, the closer to like labor parts of research, so. Great, Adam, do you wanna add anything up to that? We can see you, by the way, your camera is off. Hi, sorry, just trying to find the unmute. Yeah, um, I think the great thing about Hidden Ref was that it 
Uh, so again, sorry for framing, the REF, the Research Excellence Framework, is a once every four or so years program within the UK to assess the quality of research output from our um, universities. And the Hidden REF project was about um, not assessing the researchers themselves, but all the people who, as Rose had um, alluded to, actually contribute to research as well. So the technicians, the videoscopists, the people who pair microscope slides, the people who you know work on repositories and so on. Um, and it, it made the really important point and of the impact of those people. And I just wanted to back up um, Rosa's point about how important it is to kind of quantify their impact on the outputs of research as well, because um, there's a there's this famous case from a few years ago where um, no one could replicate the results of a study even in the own lab and they realized there was there's one particular centrifuge that people were using um, and when they used that centrifuge that was all the results and all sorts were the same and without actually using that centrifuge none of the actual results had come out correctly and it was that particular piece of equipment that was key to the actual you know scientific process that was happening um, and again and any kind of variability um, is important in this process and that applies to the people in that chain sometimes um, and in the olden times because I am actually very old um, when we were doing lots of slide preps um, in um, like kind of microbiology there was a technician in one of our labs who was just amazing at preparing samples and you could do a lot of really good work with the slide that had been prepared by him because you could see all the contrast seal cells and you could get work done faster and better so yeah hey, yeah thank you so much adam for your comments and maybe you can talk with further with rose if needed um we unfortunately have to go to the next uh, plenary session but uh, there is one more comment uh, for Adrian here from Andrew, uh, Andrew Miles. Yes, I've heard similar reactions, learning moments, trying to encourage the, uh, data sharing practices in my department, which includes many quality researchers with sometimes very different norms. So he shares your thoughts. And uh, also, I think that was for Valentin. Uh, in case you missed, Jenny Evans said, we have a Padlet you can contribute to, or maybe this was for everyone but it was during our talk, Valentin. Um, for everyone. Yes. Yeah, so that's it for Lightning Talks. Thanks, everyone. And we will continue with the plenaries. Thank you all. Matthew, you're the host now. I'll log out. Um, I'm chairing this session. Um, so you're meant to be hosting this. Oh Susan. yeah, I'm the host. Yeah, you're the chair. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, I, I did this. I did this yesterday as well. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. go good, um, good. One second. I was like, please don't log out. <laughs> no. Can can you uh, can you give me the host again? I made you the host. Because <laughs> I need to pause recording. Third day, still learning. <laughs> Oops. With us now. Okay. Great. Let me pause. Yeah. Um, so great. All right. Welcome everybody to this session on assessing researchers. Um, so I am Matthew Page. I'm a senior research fellow from the School of Public Health and Preventive Medicine at uh, Monash University in Australia. Um, and first of all, I want to uh, acknowledge the uh, traditional owners and custodians of the lands on which I'm presenting here, uh, which are the uh, Wurundj Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, and I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Um, so for this session, what uh, we have decided to do is um, throughout the conference, uh, there's been a bit of talk about what the current issues are with um, how we assess 
researchers for hiring, promotion and funding. Um, and we thought it would be good to have a, a special deep dive session on this topic to uh, discuss these issues of what are the problems uh, that uh, uh, with the current metrics and systems that we use and what are some strategies that can be implemented to help uh, reform uh, these uh, measures. And, um, and also talk a little bit about what impact COVID-19 has had on this, um, uh, on, on all of these issues. So we've got uh, four speakers today and what um, we've decided to structure this session um, by each of them will speak for about 10 minutes, um, essentially addressing a question that I've posed to them um, prior. And so that should take us to about 45 minutes. And then um, we'll have an open discussion where um, I've got a list of questions, additional questions I can pose, but I'm also hoping that several of you will have um, questions yourself uh, to ask the speakers. Um, so uh, you're able to in, uh, answer any questions, sorry, pose any questions in the chat and I'll keep an eye on that throughout the session. Um, but first of all, to start us off, I'd like to introduce uh, David Moore who is a senior scientist in the Clinical Epidemiology Program at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute and director of the Centre for Genealogy. He's also a professor in the School of Epidemiology and Public Health at the University of Ottawa, where he holds a university research chair. Uh, David's an associate director of the International Congress on Peer Review and Scientific Publication, and is a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences and the Royal Society of Canada. And he's had a long career in uh, improving the transparency and reproducibility of research largely in the health sciences and has in recent years turned his attention towards um, this issue of how we uh, should best assess scientists. And so the question I posed to him was, um, what are some of the problems with current criteria for assessing researchers and what criteria do you think we should be using instead? So take it away, David. Thank you, Matt. So I'm going to uh, mm, mm, it says only one participant can share. So um, you know, maybe I can share. Although I don't think I can. Oh, yes, I can. Okay, thank you. Um, and thank you for that introduction. Um, can you see my slides, Matt? Yeah, great. Okay. So, um, I hope I'm answering this question, Matt. <laughs> anyway, um, so my annual assessment is, uh, you know, largely based on the number of publications that I have over a defined period of time. Uh, the journal impact factor is uh, very important, uh, particularly if I publish in journals with an impact factor of five. My institution is also interested in the number of grants and contracts I have, and they are very excited over H indexes as well. I'm not rewarded nor incentivized uh, as to whether I register my research, which is mandated by the Canadian federal agencies for funding. So when we say, when I say tri-agency, I mean all the federal agency funders in Canada. Uh, I'm not rewarded whether my research is openly available to others, which is also mandated. And I'm not rewarded whether I've shared my data, which is now mandated. And I'm not rewarded whether I've practices uh, what we call um, RCR, which is Responsible Conduct of Research, which again is mandated by the tri agency. So that's kind of interesting to me. There are mandates out there that um, I'm not incentivized or awarded to. So we were sort of wondering whether uh, my inst institution is an outlier. And so what we decided to do is uh, look cross-sectionally at um, about 170 um, principally universities. And we looked to see their guidance on uh, what sort of criteria did they use for uh, hiring, promotion, and tenure? Um, we had 12 criteria. Five of them were traditional, and five of them were what I would call um, uh, sort of progressive. 
So if something progressive would be a data sharing and something traditional would be, you know, how many papers uh, have, I, have I published? And what you can see in the bar chart below is by and large promotion is dictated by very traditional sort of metrics. And the question is uh, sort of do traditional metrics result in wasteful research? And I'm not suggesting a cause and effect here. What I'm suggesting is there's probably some relationship. And I always return to this uh, Lancet series because I think it's, at least in biomedicine, the most comprehensive review of um, sort of wasteful research. And it, it starts with, in a sense, the question we're asking all the way through the research process to the transparency and completeness of research reports, which are problematic. And so um, I guess the question uh, that I've asked and many others have asked, um, you know, should researchers be assessed on open science practices? And uh, we can sort of see here as an example, the, the, Wel the Wellcome Trust <clears throat> had a very nice initiative at the beginning of the uh, pandemic where they sort of said to um, organizations, ooh, my Lord, uh, could you please share your data, make sure your results are in an uh, open access environment? And um, hundreds of organizations signed up to this, in, including our um, Canadian Institute of Health Research. And as you can see, um, sort of be careful of the X axis because it's trimmed back quite a bit. But if you sort of look at the, uh, at the uh, Y axis, you'll see that actually <clears throat> there's very little data or code that was made available. And so, you know, that's, uh, that, that's problematic. Why, why aren't people do, uh, sharing information in, in a pandemic? And so why, why would we think about sort of moving away uh, from the traditional system uh, of assessment to one where open science might be helpful? Well, I, I would argue, and many others have argued, perhaps even more eloquently than I have. I, I see uh, the metrics tied, which uh, uh, James uh, uh, led, which is in a very important piece, the, the DORA initiative, Leiden, lo lots of others have come before me and, and said, uh, you know, very important uh, points uh, 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 about metrics. But, you know, I highlight two. One is Peter Higgs, a theoretical physicist, a physicist at the University of Edinburgh uh, was incredibly embarrassed by his uh, so-called lack of output. And uh, nevertheless, um, you know, Peter Higgs is from Higgs uh, Boson. Uh, he's obviously a reasonably smart person. He won the Nobel Prize in physics. And another person uh, is Atul Gaiwandi. Um, his most important job to me is he's a staff writer at the New Yorker, but he does have a day job where he's an oncologic surgeon. And uh, he, he wrote a, a very important article in the New Yorker in 2010, 2010 called Letting Go, where he sort of highlighted um, a, a young woman's um, sort of end of life scenario and sort of asked, you know, should we be actively treating people? And what is the sort of cause, what is the cost benefit analysis of doing that? He followed that up four years later with a, a very important book, uh, Being Mortal. It has won several awards and it sparked tremendous discussion. This was not published in a journal. This was published, you know, if you want to call it in the lay press, but it's profoundly important. And why wouldn't you want to capture that as impact? Uh, the journal impact factor is not a measure of quality. And very sadly, in, in, in my school of epidemiology, people still think it is a measure of quality. And maybe that's a reflection of my inability to influence them. Um, and I would also say that the, uh, in a sense, the current Canadian government um, which is an open government, they have documentation for that. Their, their open scholarship mandates are what I would call sort of lost in translation. As you can see, at least in, in the example I gave you of me, they're not used in research assessment and 
you know, um, this is a public audience, so I won't say, I won't say anything more revealing. Um, and so what we came up with it, um, at the uh, sixth uh, World Congress of Research Integrity was looking at the Hong Kong uh, principles for assessing researchers. We, with a research integrity lens, we came up with uh, five principles. And what I'm just going to do is give you a couple of examples. One of them is value the practice of open science. Uh, we see that at the NIH, we see that at the uh, National Institutes, uh, sorry, the National Academies of, of Science, Engineering and Medicine. The issue is though, it's pretty easy to endorse something. It's much more difficult to implement. And even if it's implemented, how would you uh, evaluate it? And uh, uh, here is, um, uh, you know, our new mandate that the Canadian government has put out about uh, data sharing. Uh, they will start uh, next year, 2022, with uh, DMPs, data management plans, and in 2023, they will require actually uh, actual data sharing. We also know uh, evidence supporting the principle of data sharing also comes from patients. Patients are very clear about them wanting to uh, share their data. Um, value complete reporting. Uh, Non-reporting, here is an example, a recent example, uh, across uh, 36, uh, 36 medical centers in Germany. And what you can see on, on the y-axis is that um, there is about a 40% publication rate on average of uh, research that is uh, clinical trials that are uh, funded. So, so that means 60% um, are hidden. That is not so good. Uh, we have comparable data in Canada uh, based on 6,700 tiles that would suggest that actually the situation in Canada is even worse. Uh, value complete reporting, use reporting guidelines. There is uh, evidence, direct evidence, indicating from randomized trial evidence, should I say, that use of reporting guidelines does improve the um, completeness and reporting of clinical trials, and there are examples for other uh, research designs as well. Uh, I, I think that I would uh, end uh, sort of with the um, outgoing chief scientists of Australia, um, who indicated that people respond to incentives, and um, the notion that, in a sense, promotions should be con contingent on best practice. I think shouldn't be lost on sort of how we might. Uh, might want to go forward here. I think that's me, Matt, and I'll stop sharing so I can let others um, move on. Thank you so much, David. Um, and I think what we'll do is um, uh, collate questions for all at the end. Um, sure. uh, so people, feel free to start typing in your questions if you have them. Um, but now who I'd like to introduce is Nomi Orbord Bon, who is a postdoctoral researcher currently doing research on research at Hasselt University in Belgium and Amsterdam University Medical Centre in the Netherlands. She is originally from Quebec in Canada, where she studied cognitive neurosciences and psychiatry, but she quickly became uneasy with academia's pressure to publish in hyper competitive environments, so she decided to change field to address these issues. Uh, Numi recently completed her PhD at Hasselt University, uh, during which she explored different stakeholders' perspectives of the impact the current research assessments and definitions of success in science have on research practice and research integrity, and her postdoctoral work continues in this direction, mostly looking at different aspects that shape research environments, research assessments, and research practices. And uh, the, the questions I posed to her was, how do researchers and other stakeholders view indicators used in research assessments, such as our productivity-based metrics and measures that indicate transparency and quality of research? And, and what are some of the challenges in adopting um, more transparency, quality-based indicators? So uh, thank you, Nimi. Okay, you should all see my screen. Okay. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, thanks a lot, uh, and thanks a lot for inviting me, Matthew, and, and for having me here. I think this is a very exciting conference. 
Uh, and I hope I will answer your question um, well enough. So uh, your two questions. The first one was to talk about the perspectives uh, of different stakeholders about uh, the indicators that are used in research assessment. And the second one is to talk about the challenges of adopting new indicators more related to transparency and quality. So to answer these uh, questions, I decided to focus on some research that I've done. So it's a very small sample of what is out there, uh, but that's what I'm, I'm most familiar with and I know we will expand uh, during the discussion. So I, I chose three uh, empirical uh, studies that I've done and I will present some of the results to answer the questions. So the first uh, findings that I want to present come from a series of focus group and interviews that I conducted with diverse stakeholders um, in research. So I uh, included stakeholders, not only researchers, uh, but a lot of different stakeholders uh, throughout the research uh, scene, mostly in Flanders. Uh, and I asked them about success in science, about problems of science, and about responsibilities for change. So two things that I want to talk about. So first, I noticed that uh, the stakeholders maintain that success in research careers is not necessarily the same as success for research, and it may possibly even lead to detrimental research practices. So much like uh, what David just mentioned, uh, success, success in research careers is really oriented towards output, quantity, exceptional findings, individual achievements, competition, fashionable topics, uh, but not so much towards activities that promote quality, transparency, openness, uh, collaboration, and etc. So that's the first point. Um, I also noticed that there are important disagreements on the indicators of success. So one uh, very well-known example is the impact factors, and I saw some very opposing views. What's interesting is I was asking people about the impact factor and about research integrity, and I still had many of my respondents saying that the impact factor was a measure of quality and that it was related to the quality of individual papers or of journals. Uh, but on the other hand, I had other respondents who said that the impact factor was useless, toxic, biased. So I really had the uh, opposition in the views of my respondents. Um, I also asked about other indicators of success, which are not assessed right now, but which, are, which were mentioned to be important, like open data. And I noticed that open data was valued by most, and they said that it was a very important aspect of good science. Uh, but they were still reluctant to share their data, or they were told that they should not share their data because they would be scooped. So we have this sort of dichotomy of we know this is important, but we're not ready to do it. Uh, on open access, I also uh, found most people to be much in favor of open access, especially young researchers who had trouble to find articles uh, and, and they really valued open access. But at the same time, I had some respondents saying that open access was an unfair business model and that because the profit was generated by publishing articles, they would publish anything. So we can see that there's still disagreement on these indicators, which we tend to think are quite um, well known right now. The second step, uh, the second set of findings that I want to talk about comes from a small survey that I conducted with researchers. So in this survey, I asked uh, different researchers, mostly Flemish researchers, again, that was during my PhD, I asked them to rate the importance of diverse indicators in advancing their career, in advancing science, and on their personal satisfaction. So this is my finding. I had 18 indicators. I'm not going through that because I don't have time, but I just want to point out some uh, key points. So there were some indicators that were thought to be very important for science, for advancing science, but not so much for advancing careers. And these tended to be uh, related to openness, transparency, quality, and innovation. But on the other end, there were some um, indicators that were thought to be very important for advancing careers, but not so much science. And these tended to be related to competition, status, prestige, and luck. So basically, researchers view a disconnect between the indicators that are used to assess their career and those that would advance science. There is no surprise here. 
Um, and the last step uh, of uh, the last set of findings that I want to talk about come from a very recent uh, survey that uh, we are conducting as part of the project I'm currently part of, the SOPS for Ri project. Uh, the survey was coordinated by uh, Nick Allum and Abigail Raid from the University of Essex, so I thank them for sharing their data. This is all preliminary data, uh, so it can change after we clean up outliers and people who didn't respond to the full survey. So be mindful that the final data might change. But this is a very big scale survey uh, among European researchers, also some Canadian, US and Australian researchers were included. So during, in this survey, we included two questions that looked at research assessments. One of the questions was asking uh, respondents about uh, different uh, activities of science and about how important it would be to include these activities in assessment of researchers' performance. So this is uh, all our results and I'll just go through three trends with you. So there were some indicators that some activities or indicators that were thought to be fairly important or somewhat important, but not so much uh, rated as very important. And what's quite interesting here is that publication metric was one of these uh, indicators. Other indicators were a bit more of a middle ground so more people thought they were very important but they were still not uh, in the extremes uh, this was outreach and communication to of research to the public um, and there were some indicators that were thought to be very important by the majority of respondents so these were teaching leadership supervisory responsibilities peer review and collegiality so these were thought to be extremely important well extremely important, sometimes mostly very important, uh, and they should be included in research assessment. But these are largely absent in current assessments. So basically we understood that the indicators that researchers find most important are still largely absent from current assessments. The second question from uh, the same big large scale survey, uh, we showed the respondents a statement and then we asked them whether this is a good idea. So the statement was that organize, organizations or research institutions should not assess researchers using metrics that emphasize quantity or journal level impact, such as publication counts, H index and journal impact factors. So then we asked them, is that a good idea or not? Uh, this is on a subset of respondents, so it's not on the whole uh, survey respondents. What we found is that over half of the people think this is a good idea, still not overarchingly uh, uh, majority, but still over half. And when we look at the results in more detail, uh, we, there are some things that I thought were pretty interesting in here. So first, uh, only 10% of um, early career researchers think that this is a bad idea, so that research institutions should continue using uh, metrics that emphasize quantity and journal, impact, journal level impact. But twice as many uh, late career researchers think this is a bad idea. Retired researchers uh, were quite neutral on this question. And finally, almost a quarter of the early career researchers thought this was an extremely good idea. So this is really the extreme of the answers. And we can see early career researchers are quite above here compared to the later stage uh, researchers. So based on that, we can say that there is a general agreement that things need to change, that we have a problem, uh, but there are still disagreements that complicate how they should change. So to go back to the answers uh, that Matthew posed to me, um, in terms of perspective, I said that success in research careers is not necessarily success for science, for research, and it may possibly even lead to detrimental research practices. I said that researchers view a disconnect between indicators used to assess their careers and those that would advance science. And I said that indicators researchers find most important are largely absent from current research assessments. In terms of challenges, well, I said that even though there seems to be a general agreement that things need to change, there are important disagreements on the value of specific indicators and on how things should change. So I 
wanted to focus on these findings, which are based on uh, the work that I'm doing, but I realized that this is just a tiny piece of a tiny piece of the big puzzle of research assessment, where there is so much happening right now, it's really booming. Um, but there's, uh, despite the challenges that I've mentioned, I think there's still a lot of hope for change. Uh, the people are more, much more aware of the problems that we have. Uh, we are starting to agree on solutions. We still have some disagreements like I showed and like the, the literature is showing, but we are starting to agree on solutions. And I think we're really seeing a momentum for change. So on this, um, I will let the floor to other panelists. Thanks so much, Nemi. Yeah, really interesting data you've got there. Um, and we'll uh, uh, save questions for the end. Um, for now, I will now move on to James Wilsden, who is a digital science professor of research policy at the University of Sheffield and director of the Research on Research Institute, or RORI, an international consortium working to advance transformative research on research systems, cultures, and decision making. Over a 25 year career, James has worked in think tanks and as a director of science policy for the Royal Society, the UK's National Academy. And previously, he chaired the UK's campaign for social science and led an independent government review of responsible use of research metrics published in 2015 as the metric title. So uh, welcome, James. Great. Thank you, Matthew, very much. Uh, it's good to be here. And uh, thanks as well to, uh, to David and, and Naomi for setting the, uh, the scene so well. I think what I'm going to say will, will complement uh, uh, nicely what, what they've already uh, uh, started us uh, thinking about over, over the last uh, 20 minutes. Um, so Ma Matthew asked me to talk mostly about what funders are doing in this space, uh, which is something that we've been um, engaging with quite heavily over the past uh, 18 months or so through uh, Rory, the, the Research on Research Institute, and also through some work that we've been doing with uh, this big alliance of public funding, funding agencies uh, called the, the, the Global Research Council, which uh, I'll say a bit more about in a moment. Um, but just to sort of set the scene, um, we, in the work we've been doing, and I think the same applies to others, uh, have increasingly started talking about these debates in terms of responsible research assessment. Um, I think a lot of us, myself included, sort of entered uh, these discussions with more of a focus on uh, the metrics piece, as it were, of all of this. And, and as Matthew mentioned, I chaired this metric tide review, among other things, for the uh, for the UK system a few years ago now. Um, but um, we're increasingly seeing this sort of language, this term responsible research assessment bandied around. Uh, as a way of trying to connect some of the specifics around indicators to uh, the broader dynamics of uh, institutions and, and cultures that we've been uh, touching on already. Uh, and I think it's quite helpful in, in that respect. There isn't really a hard definition of, of RRA, uh, but we tried in this uh, little working paper we did uh, just a, a year ago now, uh, to uh, at least attempt a way of, of defining uh, defining what it is. Um, it, it draws on other frameworks, responsible research innovation, RRI, just to keep your acronym list long. Um, uh, but I think the, 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 the distinction here is that um, when we talk about RRI, we're talking really about the broad governance of research innovation systems. Uh, so it's at the very sort of macro level, responsible metrics, take you down to the micro level of, of, of individual indicators and, and their pros and cons and uses and abuses uh, whereas RRI is a sort of meso level kind of debate it's focusing on uh, the role that institutions funders research institutions publishers and others play in uh, developing and, and strengthening improving pluralizing uh, methodology systems cultures of research assessment so that's at least an attempt to uh, to, to uh, explain the term. Um, there's lots going on. I mean, I totally agree with what, what uh, Naomi's just said. I, I think there's a huge amount of activity in the field. It's great. In that report, we list what we call our sort of 15 movers and shapers, some of which we've heard about already today. Uh, certainly, I feel relatively positive when I look at this pace of progress across these debates. There's obviously still a lot to do, but it has moved on 
uh, immeasurably really when we think how far we've come in in well we're approaching nearly a decade i guess since since dora was first uh, uh, agreed but uh, uh, there's a huge amount of activity as, as, as we've already heard um to focus on funders specifically so we did this uh, survey of members of the global research council uh, there are about 170 um, public funding agencies who are members of the grc so it's usually the the main or, or in countries where there are two or three uh, like like canada or the us um uh, they would all be members the big public funding agencies so it's not foundations it's, it's sort of public funders um and we did a sort of survey of that group uh, and had a reasonably good response rate um uh, just under half of all of the members of the grc uh, but a, a reasonable geographic spread um, and what we saw in that work was that while it's certainly not universal the endorsement and uh, engagement from a funder perspective in the various frameworks and initiatives that have been most uh, influential in these debates there is definite movement and progress over the past few years it's a bit unevenly spread geographically europe definitely has the most going on uh, asia pacific uh, in some respects the the, the, the least um, unsurprisingly because it was a survey of grc members that the grc statements are the things that they themselves produce so it wasn't surprising i guess that they, they'd all signed up to those but uh as i say you see some progress uh, when we also asked them about which indicators they were currently using in the blue here and those that they were considering using again um some signs of movement away from as we heard from from david at the start uh uh a narrow focus on uh, the traditional bibliometric indicators towards uh, uh, some more diverse indicators, although still uh, some distance to travel there as well. Um, so generally, though, a sign of a, of a sort of system on the funding side where there is a lot of um, movement. Uh, it's not a sort of settled position. It's changing quite quickly. Individual funders are taking more proactive leadership positions. Uh, Welcome Trust, I've put here as an example. Um, the GRC collectively, off the back of this work, um, then had responsible research assessment as a big theme in its annual meeting um, this year, uh, which was in May. Um, and they've gone on now to um, set up a working group on RRA, which is the way that they tend to do things through the GRC. So this is a slide. I spoke, in fact, at the, the, the meeting of their Asia Pacific um, regional chapter just earlier this week, and this was the, the, the way they were talking about the progression of their work there as a group. So you can see uh, a, a sort of movement uh, through which I would hope and expect more funders uh, to uh, become actively engaged. Um, I just wanted to end with sort of five quick priorities for where I think these debates need to go next, or, or sort of things that still need more work, as it were. Uh, a first priority, I think, is to continue to build national and international coalitions for responsible research assessment. Um, I don't think we necessarily need more uh, manifestos and declarations. We've all contributed and, and we've got an excellent set of those, but it's more how one builds the actual um, institutional, uh, you know, coalitions of, of, of actors to, to embed and, and, and progress this stuff. Uh, nationally, locally and, and internationally. Um, in the UK, off the back of the metric type, we set up this thing called the UK Forum for Responsible Research Metrics, which has been a very useful sounding board for funders, university leaders and others. Uh, the Finns have something similar there in the middle. There are various efforts around the place. I think it's important often to embed these debates in your own national system for them to really have purchase and bite on the key uh levers of of change that that, that that matter i mean some things are obviously international others to still have purchase uh locally uh as was mentioned in the session we were just coming in on before uh things like the ref in the uk are very very powerful tools of uh assessment and uh one needs to think through specifically how these debates relate to something as as big and, and pervasive as as that um we need to continue to strengthen the guidance and templates that take these high level principles and, and embed them in institutional policies and practices. Dora, I think, has done fantastic work in this regard over the past two, three years to really uh, build on the initial declaration and sort of flesh that out with so much more, uh, um, you know, layers and layers of, of, of great examples of 
um, uh, good practice and, and institutional strategies and approaches. So it's a sort of, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, the additional text, as it were, sort of, if one thinks of as a religion, you've got the core kind of <laughs> statement that came down uh, from the original meeting, and now you've got all of this great rich literature of sort of uh you know practice and and, and, and ethics etc that's building up which i think is very very valuable um priority three is to continue of course as we all say in this arena to experiment to evaluate to amplify what works it's not a done deal this stuff we need to keep testing uh, and we're a long way off having uh, uh, established ways of doing it so i really welcome all efforts to do that um the Fourth, uh, I was going to mention is to think, I think, a bit harder and more critically about uh, regimes and frameworks for compliance, accountability and enforcement. Um, uh, both David and I were among others who got involved as uh, players, I guess, or sort of spokespeople for these sorts of debates, uh, a, a debate in the UK system um, that rumbled this year around the University of Liverpool where uh, the university management was trying to use in a rather crude way some, some inappropriate metrics as the basis of a set of redundancies. Um, it sort of flared up and, and fortunately the issue was ultimately resolved and the people who were going to be fired weren't fired, which was good. But it raised at a sort of deeper level some quite significant questions. So here you had a university, Liverpool, that was a signatory to DORA and yet it had interpreted its uh, participation in DORA as still enabling it to do the things it was doing and, and DORA as an organization found itself and Stephen Curry as the chair of DORA really at the sort of fulcrum of a, of a very difficult set of debates which Nature and others picked up on and I think we don't have time to unpack that now but I think it really highlights the you know these initiatives particularly the high profile ones DORA Leibniz have, have all emerged you know very recently that they're, they're, they're staffed if at all by very very small fragile organizations i mean dora now i think has two and a half full-time people and that's probably the biggest of all of them uh and yet in terms of the governance of research nationally internationally we're vesting more and more responsibility on these very fragile uh and unsupportive initiatives unsupported initiatives and i think we just need to think about this stuff as infrastructure and it needs investment for it to be done well and we need to think about enforcement. Uh, my final one is just a, a, an obvious one but it's worth saying that the uh, you know I was I, I come originally out of STS so I always sort of think of metrics as a technology in a sort of STS sense and the tools and technologies of assessment continue to evolve and, and of course many of the questions that are thrown up by that evolution and by new technological possibilities are the same questions uh, if asked afresh in new contexts some of them are new questions um, but I think at the moment there's a big flurry of interest uh, and, and, and no doubt uh, a lot of potential as well with respect to machine learning, AI and other uh, newer approaches to uh, assessment systems. Uh, in the UK, you see there on this slide on the right, a, a tender that's out at the moment to do a big study for the UK system of responsible uses of technology assisted research assessment by which they mean not just metrics but you know machine learning and other more autonomous systems. Uh, this stuff is is really important and we need to make sure that our debates about responsibility and about ethics and about good governance keep pace with the technologies of, of assessment and evaluation. So with that I will uh, leave you. Thank you very much for the chance to be part of uh, the discussion uh, today. Thanks so much James. Uh, really good uh, overview of all these different initiatives um, and the role of funders can play with this. Um, so our final speaker is Larissa Shamsir, who's a postdoctoral fellow with the Knowledge Translation Program at Unity Health Toronto in Canada, and she's currently undertaking research examining equity in academic reward and publishing. Um, and her research today has focused on optimizing research transparency to reduce research waste. Um, and the questions I posed to her were, has the COVID-19 pandemic provided an opportunity to reevaluate how we assess researchers, or has it simply widened the existing gap uh, between men and women in success indicators? And what strategies can uh, academic institutions, funders, journals, and men in academic science take to ensure women and other intersectional identities do not fall behind? So welcome, Larissa. 
Hello. Hi. Um, thanks for having me, Matt. And um, very honored to be on the panel with these um, bright researchers. David, hi. <laughs> that, uh, David's my PhD supervisor, which I finished la uh, earlier this year. So um, nice to see him again. Oh, one sec. I'm sharing. Yeah. Can you see me, my screen now? Yeah, great. Okay, so um, I will be talking about COVID impacts and opportunities for equity and assessment in academic health sciences. I have a few competing interests. My spouse owns a peer review management company. Um, for contextual competing interests, I'm a woman with intersecting identities and have lived experience in this area. Um, I have an academic interest and hold grants in this area, and I'm an editor, protocol editor for the journal Systematic Reviews. Um, so gender is just one of many social identities. Uh, the reason that we focus on gender is because it's the gap between genders is where the most disparities occur among all social identities, not just in academia, but in broader society. So social identities are compounded by systems of privilege, power, and oppression, leading to inequities and discrimination. And so when you combine gender with, say, race um, or other uh, social identities, it uh, really, there's a lot of dis a lot more disparities, you know, they're compounded. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge up front that um, while gender is not a binary concept, the scientific literature is set up this way, so I'll be talking about it um, in this way for convenience. And so why should we be concerned with gender equity in academia? Well, it's an issue of justice and rights. So if we want um, women or those who are marginalized to be able to progress through academia, we have to think about how we can make that happen in an equitable fashion. Um, and so since I work in health research, my reference point is in medicine and health. Women um, clinicians uh, tend to provide a better quality of evidence-based healthcare. So they are associated with lower rates of mortality, hospital readmissions, and emergency department visits. Women spend more time with patients. They provide a more patient-centered approach. And it's shown that there's less corruption on boards when women are members. And also for researchers, research that's led by women is more likely to account for sex and gender or to ask questions about women's health. And COVID has really impacted women's productivity more than men's. And so I just wanted to kind of walk through, like, how, how can we understand why is there a gender gap? Um, and so really it begins to be emphasized a lot more during academic training and then future career progression. So in training, women outnumber men. So this is like graduate medical postdoc training. Um, and then we enter this really career, uh, fragile transition period in our careers where we're trying to transition out of training into early career. And this period is dominated by family formation or getting married, having babies, um, and that's just for biological reasons, because people are usually at the age where they want to be doing that before they're too old. Um, one statistic um, that I found really uh, concerning is that men are four times more likely to have partners with part-time or no careers, so they're not on a career path, whereas women are more likely to have partners with full-time careers who out-earn them. So, when it comes to domestic work and caring for children, that burden is really on women. Um, and when they have partners who can't take a break from their careers or who are earning money keeping the household together, the responsibility falls to women. Um, so what this does is creates a situation where women have less time and particularly less extracurricular time to devote to scholarly activities. Um, whereas men are actually benefiting from having extra time because they don't have to take care of um, children necessarily um, on average. So globally, women take on about 75% of domestic work, um, including familial care. So that's not just children, but like elderly care, cooking, cleaning. Um, and you can imagine that when women in academia have children, they're the primary caregiver. So additionally, this situation creates a scenario where men in academia are more 
able to travel. Um, and so part of this early career period might involve relocation, often it does, where people, like they finish a PhD or a postdoc and then relocating to another institution. Um, it's very difficult to, for women to do that because if they have a partner who is um, in their career and they are you know, the, the big earners, it's not always possible for women to relocate or even travel. Um, and a big part of academia is networking and, and forming networks and collaborations. And it's not possible to do that for a lot of people if you're not um, moving around and traveling and going to conferences. So later on in people's careers, there's like uh, women take on more service work. So they're still kind of like carers, they're mentors, they're teaching, they're on committees, they're taking on a lot more of that, but either they're tasked with it or they're taking it on, choosing to do that. Um, and this leads to a lot less women than men in senior or leadership positions. So that's kind of just some, some of what happens. Um, and then, of course, there are some structural biases that reinforce this gap. So we heard earlier that career progression reward is heavily weighted on publications. So first or senior author, high impact factor journals, funding the amounts and the number of grants are one, and then also um, national and international reputation. So collaborating um, across the world or across the country. So again, to achieve these things, you must be able to relocate, travel, um, spend extracurricular time on scholarly activities. And so really what the situation is, is that men's careers actually benefit from these family situations and women's are hindered. And so earlier this year, uh, there was research characterizing the motherhood penalty, which is a penalty on women's publication track record. Um, and essentially, the publication gap between men and women immediately widens after childbirth and grows over time. And so early career mothers publish significantly less than fathers or non-parents. And mothers actually publish and progress the least, followed by single men and followed by single women. So we've talked a lot about the structural biases preventing women from progressing as men do in their careers, but the situation is also hugely impacted by societal uh, gender roles, norms, and relations. So remember that these are uh, societal norms where both men and women are part of society. So this is not really meant to put the blame solely on men for gender inequity, um, but just to say, these uh, gender roles have been dramatically highlighted during COVID. So, oh, which I'll get to in a moment, but basically gender roles mean that women are expected to be primary carers. They spend 102 minutes more per minute uh, per day on household activities, women clinicians. Um, women are expected to act feminine um, or they receive, they receive less supportive reference letters. So their terms that are used to describe women are hardworking um, and terms that are used to describe men are more like brilliant and uh, top achiever. Um, and this leads to less leadership opportunities. Gender relations is really to do with privilege associated with gender. So women experience more bullying by nature of being women and harassment in the workplace. And other contributing systemic inequities are found all, all through the spectrum of research. So grant applications, women apply for and win less personnel and merit-based funding than men. Um, this, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research a few years ago had the foundation scheme program, which was really based on an individual's body of work and their merit through their career. And it was shown that women and men, their research projects were judged to be of equal quality and merit, but when it came down to the person, um, women fared a lot lower than men. Um, that program has since ended. Uh, in scholarly publishing, males are more likely to get cited than women and to publish in higher impact factor journals. Men are more likely to self-cite. And in peer review, there's bias in editorial processes in favor of male editors, male reviewers, and male authors. 
So how has COVID impacted um, existing disparities? So what it's really done is reinforce, as I mentioned, these gender norms in society. So previously where women were doing 75% of the domestic work, that's now up to 90 or more. Um, in, there's increased duties for clinicians and healthcare professionals. So women are dominate the front lines of healthcare responders. Um, and we saw this early on in the pandemic when it was thought that males are at a higher risk of negative health outcomes for the viruses, uh, for the virus, sorry, and women the clinicians stepped up. Um, and around the world, there's been repeated closures of schools and childcare centers due to COVID. And this has placed even greater responsibility on women um, as caregivers. And many women have had to leave their jobs or um, compromise their working hours. So women in academia are additionally providing more emotional support to trainees during this time. Um, and the situation has just reduced the already lower time that women can spend on research than men. So there's been a significant impact on actually early career women um, who had very young or school aged children. So just an example of the impacts of COVID, if we looked at preprints deposited in med archive, there's a definite uptick in submissions as soon as COVID starts. But when you separate out women as first authors, there's a dramatic decrease in submissions. Um, and this largely represents in medicine um, or health research, early career researchers, since they're who hold uh, the first author position typically. Um, and then, so how can we think of more equitable assessment of scientists that accounts for all of these issues and, and a lot of the, the inequities I've talked about? So one thing we need to start doing a lot more of, and we've seen a lot of this in the pandemic, is collecting data. We need uh, national, local data on researchers' experiences, their circumstances, um, using an intersectionality lens. And what that means is looking at people's multiple social identities or multiple um, demographics um, that they hold and how they're effect, looking at how they're affected and who's affected most. Um, for instance, at my institute, uh, we're having discussions about tracking maternity and parental leaves of postdoctoral researchers and also tracking their future career trajectory, trajectory to see um, exactly where they end up and if they are sort of excelling through academia or leaving academia or just the outcome. Um, their, their training. Also, there are some activities that I mentioned that more men, uh, that, sorry, that women more than men um, and underrepresented minorities typically carry out, um, such as representing their cohort on committees, offering additional time towards mentorship and teaching, and these activities ought to be rewarded. And I thought it was really neat in Naomi's presentation to see some of these that people, researchers thought some of these different things were actually more important than publications, but of course that's not what is being looked at in terms of assessment just yet. Um, and another diverse output I would add are preprints. So during COVID, we saw preprints become really popular, if not a regular way of communicating um, research. So these outputs could be considered by evaluation committees since they allow researchers to freely communicate their findings. And of course, they're beneficial to early career researchers who may not have as much success navigating pub uh, scholarly publishing. Uh, another solution is to target, uh, to have targeted solutions helping specific groups facing disparities. So for example, in 2009, the NIH launched a program that offered supplemental funding to funded researchers and postdocs to help hire support to keep their projects running. So this was not necessarily support for them during their leave, which also exists, but this was to keep their projects running so they could hire additional staff while they're away on family leaves. Um, something put out by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research was this um, universal pausing of the clock for all early career researchers. And I'm not certain I agree that this is actually a great idea because this means that there are some early career researchers who still will be getting ahead because they're actually getting more time to complete their research and to achieve some of the um, things that they need to move on to the next career stage. And then there's those who actually um, might need the time who are away on leaves 
um, and have reduced working hours during the pandemic. Um, and so also some scholarly journals have started to take action towards more diverse representation among authors, research topics, editorial boards, peer reviewers. In 2009, The Lancet published a whole issue in which women authors and women's health issues were the focus. Um, and another is a coalition among publishers that's just formed, initiated by the Royal uh, Society of Chemistry. And that has brought together the world's largest publishers to take collective action toward greater diversity and inclusion. And in the first instance, they're starting by collecting data on their authors, reviewers, and editors um, on, on their demographics, so like gender, ethnicity, country of origin. And then there are some simple solutions for men in academic science who can insist on gender equity in their own research activities. So this is an example of male researchers who reject invitations to speak on all male panels, which I learned are called males. So I think that's all I have for today and we can move on to questions. Thanks so much, Larissa. A really uh, detailed, impressive survey of uh, the current state of affairs and a range of different initiatives suggested. So um, I'd like to thank all the speakers uh, for their wonderful presentations. And now uh, we've got about uh, just under half an hour uh, for times for questions. So I think uh, if Susan, if you can allow, give people the opportunity to unmute themselves and people can either raise their hands or type in the chat um, any questions that they have, that would be fantastic. So I already see a question from Alex Holcomb. Yes, thanks, uh, Matt. Um, great presentations. Larissa, you had one very striking statistic, which I had difficulty uh, parsing, but um, I apologize that I missed that. Something about 86 to 90 some percent of researchers with something, non-male partners, something. I, I didn't quite understand that, but it was uh, it sounded like a huge effect. So I thought it was important. So I wonder if you could go back to that slide and uh, or, or just explain that. Sure, I'll go back to it. I think I know the one you're talking about. Oops. Yeah, yes. okay, so uh, that's right. So the career output of mothers is 74 to 83% of what fathers have. Women without children, let's see, um, publish 80. Yeah, okay, so of male non-parents. So I guess that's women. So I've talked a lot about women who are mothers um, and focus a lot on that, but it's also this gap and exists for women without children who aren't mothers. Um, and also males who are not parents. So if you look at just male and female without kids, women still tend to publish um, less than men. But maybe that disparity is, is the point, maybe that disparity is less than uh, among the, among, uh, than if a woman is a parent, because it's 90%. That's, right, that's right, yeah, so it's a lot yeah. less. That's correct, yeah. yeah. Okay. So it's a lot Thank less, you. but there's still a disparity, yeah, for sure. Alex. Um, just a couple of questions I've got. Um, so uh, firstly, um, James, you were talking about how we've got uh, um, at the moment certain things like Dora only really have like two people, uh, I guess, man in the fort. Um, and I assume that applies to a lot of these other initiatives and manifestos and, and what sort of things can be done to um, I guess, support them financially and infrastructurally? And do you have any ideas on um, so that they don't just trickle away? Yeah, th thanks, Matthew. I, I, I mean, I think there is a growing recognition, as I say, um, and it was interesting to see some of the discussion prompted by the, the Liverpool episode about this. Um, I think there is a growing recognition of the need to make sure that these uh, sorts of initiatives are properly uh, resource so that they are sustainable because of course I mean while it's great and and we can all welcome um, more uh, funders you know issuing mandates that require all you know all their grant holders to have signed up to Dora or, or to have you know put this policy or that policy in, in place uh, or, or ditto you know universities doing the same uh, 
clearly if the if the uh, organization at the receiving end as it were the the, the the convening body that's initiated is 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 you know running on a <laughs> on a sort of shoestring then it, then then ultimately this isn't gonna gonna work so i think the i i do think as i said in my earlier remarks i think i think it's quite helpful to think of these things as soft infrastructures of governance in the way that we think about other forms of research infrastructure whether it's data infrastructure or other stuff and and, and that sort of shifts our mindset to to really recognizing that this isn't a sort of um optional extra it's a sort of an essential piece of the plumbing of the of the system and if we don't you know invest something in it i mean it doesn't need very much if it does need something then uh you know the pipes are going to get blocked and, and we're going to have a problem so i think that's that that's sort of where we're at but i mean you know it's still relatively early days in terms of that being thought through i think the only other thing i'd say about this sort of institutionalization of this stuff is that i think um it, 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 there is a slight risk i guess in this whole space that you know particularly say from a university perspective um you know most universities of course have, have had to establish larger um administrative teams infrastructures to deal with uh, open research in, in its various forms. Uh, in many countries, you've had to do something structurally to deal with impact as an issue. I mean, certainly here in Britain, you know, most universities will have a team of people who, who focus on impact in a professional services sense alongside the stuff that, 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 that researchers and academics themselves are doing. Um, uh, and as we keep layering additional uh, agenda items as it were whether it's metrics or rra or issues around research culture all of which are important and all of which you know i'm sure we all as a group uh, fully endorse and applaud we need to think about how much of that stuff at an institutional level can be uh, brought together how much is different which bits of an institution are responsible for dealing with it so some of the issues we're talking about here i mean in a way are best dealt with by the hr function for example you know if it's about issues of promotion and and uh you know annual appraisals and assessments other issues uh are, are best dealt with by the research office and it's these kind of rather boring but actually quite essential things that we also need to give attention to you know how do you embed this stuff in institutions because if it if it sort of dissipates and it's spread too broadly i think that again there's a danger that the 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 agendas plural won't quite cohere and, and potentially you know go backwards as well as forwards um, okay, we've got a couple of hands raised. Um, I think first off, uh, I'm not sure if it's Michael or Benjamin, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, it's fine, it's fine. Ben, no um, yeah, great presentations, and I'm getting a lot of sort of optimism about how quickly things are changing. Um, so I'm a first year PhD student, and naturally I've got my eyes on the horizon for, you know, three and a half, four years down the line and thinking of future jobs and stuff. Um, how, I suppose, I'm basically, how safe is it for me to ignore or deprioritize impact factors and publication count and that sort of stuff and just sort of focus on these uh, sort of research integrity aspects? You know, are we at that stage that I can, I can forget about the impact factor stuff or do I still need to keep an eye on that? And uh, if I were to forget it, would that essentially punish me down the line because things aren't going quite as fast as perhaps we would like. Um, I know that's quite a self-serving question, but it's just sort of trying to gauge, gauge the pace, basically. Yeah. Anyone on our panel want to take a stab at that? Yeah, I can certainly have a, a, a quick go. I mean, I think, um, I would first say to you, if if you're applying to uh, get a job at the at the Utrecht University, I think you you could get rid of the journal impact factor because they publicly declare that they won't use uh, journal impact factor to assess researchers. I think more broadly and to be more serious, uh, I would not downplay the journal impact factor because uh, academic institutions are quite conservative and in general um, slow moving to put it bluntly but what i think you could do though is you could uh, sort of flesh out some information so uh, along with the journal impact factor you might uh, put on your cv 
um, is the journal an open access journal? You might want to put on your CV whether you've shared the data, whether you've shared your code. Uh, you might want to put information like that. You might want to put in, has this research, ha have you shared that? Have you discussed that with your sort of local community where you're at or your local professional community? Uh, not necessarily in a, a formal conference. So I think you should supplement your CV with other practices that um, some people uh, on the on a hiring committee might see as very positive and um, the people who are still committed to GIF will, will have that information there as well. Thanks, David. Um, uh, anyone else want to move on to that question? Otherwise, I can move to another one. I can just, uh, just add one yeah. comment. I agree with everything that David said and I mean, I, I have the luxury of working in a field where I can ignore these things as an early career researcher because I, my whole research is against these. But I think as a young researcher, if you're in a different field, I think, yeah, you don't have that luxury. Uh, one thing that I heard once in a conference, and I think is a very good recommendation, is every time you talk about your papers, try not to talk about your papers by using the title of the journal talk about your papers and what they were about so to focus the whole discussion away from the journal where you published and towards your research but besides that i agree with everything that david mentioned thanks so much Nini. um uh, joe mckenzie would you like to um speak to your uh, saying your question that you posed a bit earlier or would you like me to read it out Can't see anything, so I will read it out for you. So Joe says to Larissa, oh, after thanking everyone. All right, you ready to talk, Joe? Sorry, Matt. Yes, uh, I'm happy to happy to read it out. Um, thanks everyone for your really interesting presentation. Um, Larissa, I just guess it would be good to hear your thoughts about one solution that I've heard people put forward, which would be where the funding institutions should just allocate around 50% of funding to females. Yeah, um, thanks uh, for that question. And um, I think, I'm not sure about 50%, but I think a really neat way to go is what um, our Canadian Health uh, Research Institutes have done is, is do proportional funding. So for the amount of applications they receive. So if it's 15% of women who have applied, then 15% of women will be funded. Um, and so I think that's one way to go. Um, I also think there's there's other options, like there's lottery systems. Um, those have shown to really reduce the, so if just everyone's in the same pool and it's the lottery, it's randomly chosen who's getting funded. Those are shown to be um, more equitable in terms of who's getting funding. Um, and then another is possibly looking at like doing away with citations altogether and asking for impact in another form. So we, there's narrative CVs where people can actually like explain their societal impact of the research or the impact they've had on a uh, local community or even on graduate students. Um, and so I think that those are all other things we can start considering um, in terms of funders. And of course, um, I think there's a comment, but it does, yeah, it's in the, the comments there, but it takes a lot more time maybe to evaluate these um, different aspects and to really think through how we can we compare, um, you know, societal impact from one person to another. But I think that's also something that we can navigate. I mean, we've come up with metrics and, and, and some ways to compare people and we can come up with other, other ways to look at societal impact. I don't think it's going to be that difficult. Thanks so much, Larissa. Um, Karim, you've got your hand raised. Do you want to unmute yourself? Okay. Yep, um, I'm here. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks to everyone for the great presentations. Um, 
I've got a question um, as a someone who identifies as male, um, really for um, Noemi and um, Larissa would be if you're trying to be an ally, let's say for women, but conscious of intersectionality overall, but let's just start um, with women. Um, what would you suggest um, as concrete best steps? Okay, um, so one thing I think that's really important, you've seen a lot of this is um, just in the first instance, simple education. So trying to understand the privilege that you hold as a male um, in academia. And I think there's a lot of awareness recently about these topics, and I think that's good. So there's a lot of resources available to try to do that. Um, and it's not just as a male, I mean, like there's all the other identities that you have as well. Um, and then beyond after just learning, there's a lot you could do to put into practice. So advocating for women who you mentor or who you work with colleagues um, and just actually doing that in meetings. If you hear something that is said that is, you know, it's very simple, but if you hear things that are said that are not necessarily like the nicest things or that are discriminatory, then question the other person, even if they're your colleague. Um, those are some of the things. Um, I mean, maybe you have a few other. And of course, there's also like James and David. I'm sure they're great allies. I know David for a long time. I'm sure he has some things he could he could offer up. Uh, I I think I would like Naomi, uh, if that's how if I'm pronouncing your name name correctly to answer before I say anything. It's a hard one. I mean, because it, yeah, it forces us to put ourselves in the shoes that we've never worn, basically. <laughs> um, but I think, I mean, I just saw I was following the chat and I just saw you upvoting Joanne's question and the, this kind of dynamics were realizing that, for example, even as early as undergraduate students, men tend to ask more, uh, well, they tend to take the floor more in discussions and all of these things. These are all things that um, are difficult to realize, but I think are important. I would say, uh, read the literature. There's so much literature coming out there on the disadvantage that women have in science. And uh, reading these papers is already, I think, it's eye-opening for me so it's probably eye-opening for many people but because i'm a woman i'm interested in reading these papers i think it would be very very useful if most researchers start uh, reading about this uh, imbalance and getting to know the depth of the problem i'll add one more thing i just um, remembered that um, mentorship is also really important. And I think beyond mentorship is sponsorship where you're actually like investing something into someone else's career. Um, and along with that is kind of diverse and inclusive hiring. So if you're in a position to be able to hire people, um, like I work in a research group that is, there's two men and 25 women. Um, I think that's by design. <laughs> and, whoops. Uh, and I think that that's really that's really helpful because I mean someone has identified that women need a little bit more um, attention at certain stages of their career, and they have now invested and sponsored us to move forward. Um, I had that experience with my PhD, and again, I'm really fortunate to be in. Sorry, I keep meeting myself in that position with my postdoc. Do you want to add anything, David? And I think this, I think um, uh, two things. I, I think we need to be very actively um, promoting women in positions of leadership. Uh, when I look at most places I go to, including my own institution, uh, there are insufficient number of women uh, in leadership. I think at the other end of that is I think we need to start um, sort of, um, I don't know if the word education is appropriate for very young women to um, 
think about language that they use. So there's a, a beautiful piece in the BMJ showing that actually uh, women use different language in grant applications, a language that may not be beneficial to the outcome of getting a grant or not. And so I think that needs to be dealt with at a, at a, a very early age. Uh, so I think both of those, I think, would, uh, would help the situation somewhat. Thanks so much. Um, and uh, Rose, you asked a question earlier um, about uh, the alternative metrics. Um, just want to ask that. Yeah, so my question is, what do you think of the idea that the things that matter the most uh, are the ones that are hardest to measure? So when we're thinking about alternative metrics of valuation and trying to have more open science practices rewarded, how do you stop that from just being a box ticking exercise where it's easy to assess if people have shared their materials, but it's much harder to evaluate the quality of those materials? Anybody want to take that? Well, hi Rose, by the way. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, from my perspective, I think uh, it would be a major advancement if we could collect that information. I mean, I, I think, you know, one of the reasons the journal impact factor is so popular is, is that it is very easy to collect and you can collect it very quickly. And so if we're, uh, you know, going to move away from that, we need to be able to provide universities in a sense with, uh, you know, one of the things that we're working on is, is an open science dashboard where they would be able to say at a university or at a funder of your grantees, how many publish in an open access environment, et cetera, et cetera. And that's the same with data sharing. Now that doesn't answer Rose, your fundamental question, is that data sharing is, is a good quality or not? Well, you, you may be able to detect that by trying to capture reuse of data. Uh, but I think, I, I think you've asked a very important question and probably my bar would be much lower to try to get people to move away from the current madness that we're in to something that may be more evidence-based, more evidence-informed. Um, I'm just seeing some comments in the chat. Um, I think Esther, do you want to um, uh, raise this issue you've uh, raised in the chat about an alternative um, suggestion from early on? Uh, thanks. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Yes. Um, I was just saying uh, as a comment on the trying to teach women um, how to they should adapt their language behavior in order to receive grants that instead uh, the burden shouldn't be placed on the women uh, or uh, young women that are trying to learn this language, uh, but uh, instead that we should really train reviewers uh, to review these proposals and really have a look at the, or not judging it based on that language and really judging it on the content instead of people using the words excellent, brilliant, blah, 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 really judge it on the content instead of placing the burden again on the women, um, which was not actually the question that was asked. I have a comment on that. There was a, um, oh, sorry, David, were you fine? No, no, please go ahead, Larissa. Already, um, there, I, just yesterday I went to a talk and it was giving an example from our national health um, funder, CIHR again, and um, there, it was an example of a reviewer comment on an application that didn't get funded and it was um, an, a, an award, so it wasn't a, a project, but it was saying how the comment was that the person had used um, her leaves of absence, which were referring to maternity leaves, as excuses for not publishing um, enough. And I thought that was really interesting because CIHR does have um, permitted leave and there's a section in the applications to explain that. And I think one of the problems with that was that 
the reviewer is not then appropriately trained. Like, so the information was offered. Here's where the disruptions happen in my career. Um, and I think the reviewers need training on these issues as well. I mean, one thing in my own experience is that your maternity leave is, is disruptive, not just for the period of time that you're off. It's disruptive both before as you're preparing and after you come back, it takes a long time to catch up. It's not just like you can just turn it back on. I mean, a lot is happening physically, biologically, mentally um, with women or our parents. And it's not something that can just be pop on back in academia. So I think these are some of the things that, that are not happening. The conversations are not happening and there's a lot of misunderstanding possibly about it. So just it's a comment, but if David, I know you had a response as well. Yeah. Um, and I see a hand from James. Yeah, just quickly, so coming in on, on, on this, I mean, I, I mean, there's clearly, it's important to be addressing the training of, of panelists, etc. Um, I just wanted to endorse a comment Larissa made earlier as well about the potential use of, of alternative um, uh, evaluation mechanisms, funding mechanisms like uh, lotteries, etc. Uh, not that they're a panacea, but I do think um, uh, there's important scope to, to in the vein of what I was saying earlier about experimentation, to test and, and see the contribution that these kind of mechanisms can make to addressing forms of um, unconscious bias etc in in conventional peer review processes um, and just to give a plug we've actually just published today in fact uh, i'm looking a bit haggard it's because i've been uh, uh, up early doing a, an event in european time as well for, for we launched a, a thing with the swiss national science foundation and, and embo on uh, um, what we call the experimental funders handbook looking at the different sorts of ways funders are trialing partial randomization and, and some of the, the sort of methods that can be used there. So I think that's quite an exciting field as well. I, on the metrics point as well that was raised, I think absolutely it's great to see new alternative metrics of various kinds being developed for things like societal impact, et cetera. I think that at the same time, if we're going to properly assess the totality and, and richness of the contribution of most researchers and their research, uh, this stuff requires thick descriptions. It, it, it does require elements of narrative. It does require the qualitative alongside the quantitative. And I, I think there's no getting away from that if you want to do the job properly. That's of course less convenient, as David rightly says, uh, compared to the ease with which one can extract a general impact factor or an H index from the system. But if we're true to the integrity of what we're trying to do, then uh, I think we have to uh, retain and, and continue making the case for methodological plurality and, and uh, diversity in our in our modes of assessment as, as much as anything else. Thank you. Thanks so much, James. Um, we're just down to the final minute now, so I think um, it's been a fantastic session. And if um, if anyone want to have any final thing that they wanted to say, um, otherwise I'll uh, uh, thank everybody for attending and for all the great comments in the chat and questions and. Um, uh, I'd also like to thank um, the speakers for, um, and if everyone would like to um, acknowledge the speakers, that would be great. Um, and uh, thank you all for attending, and we will see you in the next session, which is starting right now. So um, thanks again.